Welcome back to The Daily Show, everyone. I'm so excited for everyone to be joining today. We have a jam-packed 30-minute session. My friends Ashley and Tom are here to talk about prospecting. We're going to go through so many cool stuff. We're going to have basically a guide to effective cold outreach. So if you are here and you are a seller, uh, you're in the right place. So before we get started, I want to introduce our phenomenal guests. We have Ashley. She's my coworker at Apollo. And we have Tom. He's the founder of TA Sales. Tom is fantastic. He's been on before. So has Ashley. We're super excited to have you both back. Thank you so much for coming on. Want to say a quick thank you to our partners. I'm biased, but Apollo rocks uh, and <laughs> Gong. So thank you, Apollo. Thank you, Gong. We are super grateful to both of you. Um, the daily value drop, by the way, which we're about to put in the chat is to try Apollo for free. So you've heard of Apollo. I'm sure it's a fantastic prospecting tool, uh, really appropriate for today's theme. So go ahead and use this link in the chat to give Apollo a try for free <laughs> and talk to Ashley if you want to do more, uh, with Apollo. Yes. And uh, before we dive in, if you want to get access instantly to so much phenomenal sales training, go ahead and scan this QR code, save this for after the show. But if you're looking to level up your selling game in 2023, this is absolutely the place to do it. Um, you'll get tactical deep dives, actionable takeaways, like immediately that you'll be able to incorporate into your sales flow with Sell Better's training. So... Without further ado, let's give you some of that tactical goodness right now. Today's agenda, we're going to talk through some proven techniques for effective prospecting research. So we're going to go through research and efficiency. We're going to go through strategies for multi-channel outreach. So we're not just going to focus on one channel. We're going to talk about LinkedIn, cold calling, cold emailing. And we're going to really talk through how to transform your prospecting approach to book more meetings, um, because it really does start with your mindset and your approach. But before we dive in, I'd love to know who's in the room with us. So feel free to let us know, are you an SDR, an AE, a manager, a leader, and introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like. Uh, let us know where you are calling in from. So Ashley, Tom, I've spoken enough. Uh, do y'all want to introduce yourselves really quick? Sure. Um, my name is Ashley Zaxt. I am an account executive at Apollo. I get to work with the wonderful Caroline Maloney. So um, yeah, super excited to be here. Glad you all are here to learn and have fun. Awesome. Really exciting. Uh, and Tom. Yeah, excited to be here. Tom Malamo. Uh, it's been about eight years in SaaS sales, most recently at Gong. I now run my own company. And uh, one of the main focuses is running a 30-day boot camp to help sales professionals prospect better. So stoked to be here. Heck yeah. Can That's confirm awesome. that Tom knows what he's talking about. Tom helped me out when I was first baby SDR back in the day. So oh, yeah, I should go way back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Full circle. Um, yeah, <clears throat> let's definitely put that link to your boot camp in the chat at some point, Tom. That'd be awesome for folks here. Yeah. So let's start with research. Let's just dive right in because we don't we we only have a half hour, and I really want um, to touch on all of these topics. So let's start with research, Tom. I know that you have this really cool, um, you know, kind of approach to research. Do you want to sort of take it away and and let us know what this is and how you use it? <clears throat> yeah. So when I think about prospecting, um, as you can see on the screen, I, I think about it in three levels for my research. So first, I want to look at the problem level. And what I mean by that is, what are the problems that my prospects are, are currently facing, right? So if I was selling, if I was Ashley and I was selling uh, Apollo to sales leaders, I would think that a lot of sales leaders are having trouble building pipeline, right? So that's a problem that they might have. And I want to focus on that and, and understand that. The second level is learning at the account level, what is actually going on with them? What are some triggers going on in their business that might make it a good time for me as a sales professional to reach out? So for example, again, if I'm, if I'm Ashley and I'm selling Apollo uh, and I see a VP of sales who's hiring a bunch of SDRs, that's probably good news. Uh, I did the same thing when I was at Gong. If it's the reverse and they just laid off their entire sales team, that's probably not good news and, and probably not a good opportunity for me to reach out and I would deprioritize them. Um, and then at the individual level, I'm looking at wherever I can find, you know, I can do some internet sleuthing. So if your buyers are on LinkedIn, 
uh, that's the first place that I would go, go into sales nav and see, do you have any sort of, uh, of, you know, mutual connections? Do you see any sort of past relationship that they used to work at a customer of yours? Are you this members of a mutual community, anything like that? And all I'm trying to do here is for numbers two and three, that's how I'm going to start off my email or cold call with just any bit of personalization. And then I'm going to focus the meat of my email at the problem level to focus on who has the problems that I can help solve. I love that. That's super tactical. And Ashley, it sounds like you kind of have a similar method to the madness. Do you want to sort of speak to your own way of approaching research? Yeah, absolutely. So very similar problem-based outreach. And I'm I'm looking for, like, I don't want to just go down my list in my book of business, top to bottom. That's a waste of time, right? Because like Tom said, maybe they're not actually a good fit account right now for a myriad of reasons. So definitely want to make sure I'm looking for folks who have a problem that I can solve for them or that we can solve for them. If they don't have that problem, then you know, probably shouldn't be talking to them. Um, and then very similar to what Tom said, that like these certain triggers that help you understand which accounts to go after, um, who might have that problem, um, you know, things like hiring, things like funding, things like, you know, anything in the news, new product launches, et cetera. There's, there's a ton of things you can come up with um, to help you make those decisions. I think for my AEs in the house or like full cycle AEs, the other thing to consider um, is obviously like taking a look at your closed loss um, reports in your CRM and researching and finding out like why they closed lost it. You know, if it was timing, that's low hanging fruit. If they were like, yeah, in six months, <laughs> you better reach out to them in six months. Right. So there's other things that you can look into um, within your own data to help you find those right accounts and, and people. Yeah. And I like to think of it like a pain hypothesis too, Ashley. I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that you really like to kind of categorize by potential problems when you reach out to folks you know, it's always useful, especially when you're a salesperson, you talk to these people every single day. Excuse me. I hope I'm not getting sick again. Um, And if you reach out to a prospect, you know, you're talking to these people every day, you're categorizing by pain. You can say something like, Hey, you know, Mrs. Prospect, I speak to XYZ personas every day. This is a typical challenge that they're facing. I'm reaching out to see if you are you know, also in this same boat. So I kind of like to think of that as like a pain hypothesis. So that was always part of my research when I was an SDR was hypothesizing a pain and then phrasing it in like a curious way. Um, love it. So why don't we talk a little bit? I think that this is a really contentious subject in the sales space. Time blocks. People love it or hate it. Tom, do you love time blocks or do you hate time blocks when you're prospecting? I love Love me a time block. Uh, so this is this is how I would set up a time block. Um, so first of all, um, I think the reason for time blocking is is important. Like let, let's talk about the why for a second. Uh, salespeople have so many things that they need to do every single day, right? You have to let's say you're an AE, right? You have to prospect. You have to run discovery calls, do demos, you know, send proposals, negotiate, multi-thread, join internal meetings, have a one-on-one with your boss. Uh, you know, do all these different things. And maybe you know, you're working at home, uh, like Caroline, have two dogs that you probably need to walk throughout the day too, right? So it's a, there's a lot to get done. And so I think that prospecting is, is the most important thing that you need to do consistently to make sure that you're going to be on target to hit, you know, and exceed your goals. And so you got to make time for it somehow. And for me, the easiest way to do that for my brain is to put it on the calendar. And I like to put it on um, at the time of day where my brain is the hottest. So I'm a morning person. So I like to get it done in the morning because it's tough and requires a lot of energy and effort. If I was the reverse, if you were a night owl, maybe you put it in the afternoon or the evening or something like that. And my, my intent with the, with the time block is during this time, I'm focused only on prospecting. I'm not doing research. I'm not slacking people. I'm not, you know, uh, on Instagram, I, I'm turning off notifications. I'm putting my my phone down and I'm, I'm locked in. Um, and if I can do that for, you know, say 60 minutes at a time, then that makes the rest of my job a lot easier. Um, and now I think the reverse, and, and maybe this, this may or may not be Ashley's uh, stance is that there's a lot that goes on in a day. You got to respond to customers and, you know, prospects and you get inbound leads and things like that. Um, so I think there's, there's always flexibility to be had. It's not like you can never move it or you can never skip a day. Um, but I think, setting the time block, at least for me, make sure that more often than not, I'm actually going to show up and, and do the hard thing. 
Mm, okay, cool. So it kind of helps give you that accountability and structure I'm hearing. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, Ashley, I know you and I had a very similar take on this. So I'm excited to kind of talk with, with you about this too. What, what do you think about time blocks? How do you approach this? Yeah. So I, I love the concept of time blocking. And when I was an SDR, I did it religiously um, as an AE, especially when as an AE at Chili Piper and now at Apollo where we use Chili Piper, um, that became problematic uh, because the whole point is to have like, you want meetings being booked for you, whether it's through the inbound channel or via your SDRs um, or via somebody clicking your booking link and your uh, awesome outbound emails that you're sending. So if I blocked, you know, my calendar with like prospecting or researching or this or that or whatever, like then I, no, they can't book a meeting with me because my calendar's blocked. So I had to sort of shift my thinking about time blocking. So it's, it's very important. And I would tell people, all the time that like, if it's something that you have to do at that time, like I walk my dog at lunchtime, like, you know, I block that on my calendar because that's non-negotiable. It has to happen. Um, For me, almost everything else besides like our all hands meeting and like some one-on-ones, I want that to be white space on my calendar so folks can book demos. So what I do is like on a Thursday or Friday, I'm looking ahead, excuse me, at Monday or Tuesday, seeing how many demos I have booked for me. And then I start, I use Cosmo time as my task management solution. I'll drop that in the chat. It's pretty cool. Um, And basically I just have like a running list of tasks or like uh, focus blocks of things that I know I need to get done, but I don't put them on my calendar until I want to fill in the blanks around my demos. That way I am still fully available for clients, prospects, et cetera. But then once I see, okay, I've got four demos today, that's plenty. I start filling in like, this is where I'm going to do some research. This is where I'm going to work on, you know, some accounts. This is where I'm going to do some cold calling, whatever. um, And sort of fill in the blanks from there. Love it. I think that's awesome. Yeah. You know, long story short, I feel like it, it worked different approaches work for different people. I'm personally a checklist person. I always like with my morning routine, even I never have like at 8, 15 AM, I'll do this. And at 9 AM, I'll do this. Like I just have a checklist of like 10 things I want to accomplish before 10 AM. And I try to just check them off. So love it. Um, let's talk about some tactical prospecting techniques. We've talked a little bit about research. We've talked a little bit about efficiency. Let's dive into LinkedIn and social selling. So Ashley, you have this great quote. I want you to kind of take it away. Talk a little bit about what you mean by LinkedIn is a long game. Sure. So anybody who has ever talked to me about social selling, and I've done plenty of trainings on this, both like in my organization and outside of it. Um, I am a big believer in using LinkedIn for relationship building only. So I do not do the pitch slap thing. I don't do the connect and pitch because the whole point of LinkedIn for me is to meet this person, get to know this person and understand more about that person. They could give, excuse my language, two shits about what I'm selling or what I have to say to them. Um, And so like, I think it's a long game. Um, You build these relationships, you engage with folks, you, you know, you know the drill, right? Like we could have a whole other webinar about how to interact and engage and behave on LinkedIn. Um, but then it, what what eventually starts to happen is people know you, they know about where you work, um, hopefully because your brand, your company's brand is doing a lot of work as well, right? Mm-hmm. So then it becomes sort of this passive income, so to speak, for inbound leads. So probably... I don't know, three or four times a quarter, I'll get somebody hitting me up on LinkedIn asking me more about what I'm selling. And then that gives me free reign to then pitch them, set a demo, how, you know, whatever, like, and they, they came to you, right? So I do believe it's a long game and some people aren't about that and that's okay. Um, and sometimes connecting and pitching works for people, right? So like, do you, um, but I will always be a firm believer that it is uh, relationship building first. Yeah. Amen to that. Tom, what do you think? Are, are you a connect and pitcher? No shame. But uh, well, what do you think? <laughs> so I agree with everything that Ashley's saying about um, about playing the long game. And I think um, when I think about social selling and LinkedIn, and, yeah, I don't really have anything to like change about her answer. I'd actually bring up a different kind of part of LinkedIn that I would use. 
And so now obviously Ashley and I both sell to like, you know, sales leaders and, and maybe you sell to marketing leaders, I'm not sure, but you know, people that are actively on LinkedIn, people that, you know, are engaging, they're posting, they're commenting. And there's probably a lot of folks uh, of these few hundred that are here that don't sell to people that are actively on LinkedIn. Maybe they have profiles, maybe they're updated, but you know, CISOs aren't, uh, you know, necessarily the most active LinkedIn posters, for example. Um, what I would argue, though, is that it is still a really great place to do research. One of, one of, if not the best places, you know, Sales Navigator being to find uh, great details and triggers to reach out to someone. And so um, what, I would, what I would push some folks on is if they have Sales Nav, and I don't work for Sales Nav by any means, but if you have Sales Nav to be able to use lead filters to try to find you some low-hanging fruit. And a few of my favorite ones are looking at people that were past customers so they used to work at a company that was a customer and now they're at a company in your territory, right? So if I was Ashley uh, and I saw that there was a VP of sales that used to be an Apollo champion at a certain company and then went to a new one, that would be you know nearly the lowest hanging fruit that exists out there. <laughs> uh, members of a mutual community, members that, you know, folks that are local to you or to a location where you might be doing a conference or a VIP dinner or something like that. Uh, those are a few of my favorites. I, I could talk about that all day, but um, even if you're not going to engage with them, you're not going to connect with them and, and, and try to pitch them on LinkedIn, it's a great place to find them and then you know directly integrate them to wherever you're, you know, you're making calls and sending emails. Yeah. And for those of you, by the way, uh, I, w- I want to ask everyone in the audience, does connecting and pitching work for you? Like, do you do this? And if you answer yes, um, curious, put in the chat, like what's worked for you, maybe even share the message that you use or, you know, anything that could be helpful for others. My hunch is that it works better in B2C scenarios or scenarios where you have something that's super easy to install or, you know, um, something that's free for folks to start using because for longer sales cycles, I think, uh, someone put this in the chat in the enterprise space, it takes so much longer to develop those relationships. The sales cycles are longer. It's not like you're going to pitch someone and get a yes immediately in a LinkedIn DM. So you are playing that long game. Um, Mm -hmm. I will say for folks in the audience who sell to people who are not marketers or sellers, you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, this is all well and good, but my ICP is not on LinkedIn. But to Tom's point, even if you're selling into like the security space and your ICP isn't on LinkedIn. My stepdad is a software engineer. And something that he confirmed for me is that whenever he gets a cold email, the first thing he does, when if it's a salesperson, the first thing he does is look at that person on LinkedIn to validate that they're like mm-hmm. a legitimate human. The second thing he does is checks out that company's LinkedIn page to see what they're about. So it's like, you got to think about it like this. It's not just about selling to people on LinkedIn. It's about building a cohesive brand strategy and a cohesive brand story on LinkedIn. Um, Cool. So let's talk a little bit about cold email. Um, And by the way, keep putting questions in the Q&A. We'll try to save some time at the end uh, to address them. So Tom, you had this really cool kind of structure for when it comes to email. I was hoping you could maybe talk us through this a little bit. Yeah, my, my intention here is to try to pack as much of a punch about cold email on one slide as possible. So uh, let me run through this, right? Uh, the, uh, I'll save the visual on the right for the end, but if we just go through some of the bullets, high level subject line, I want it to be two to three words. I want to pass what I call the internal email filter, right? So think about your inbox has 100 emails. You don't want to read them all. You're just scanning subject lines. There are some that just shout out that this is from a salesperson or a marketer. And most of the time, I'm just going to delete those without opening, right? So if you're talking about ROI, if you're using my first name, you know, if you're, if it's 12 words long, to me, that just shouts out you're a salesperson or a marketer. I'm not even going to read the email. So I want it to be two to three words of a vague subject about like what the email is actually about. So it's more likely for, for them to, to open it. Personalize the first sentence. This is based on some of the research that I mentioned yeah, about 10 minutes ago. Hey, Ashley saw that you were hiring, you know, saw your post about hiring 12 SDRs. You know, the middle of the email is focused on the problem. So I'm hunting, you know, we have a hypothesis about what their problem is. Hey, a lot of sales leaders tell me X, here's how I'm helping. And then the end of my email is an interest-based call to action. So um, interest-based meaning, uh, I, I just want to see if they're interested, right? Are you interested in the chat? Open to learning more? Uh, is this on your radar? Um, something like that. 
uh, performs twice as well, according to Gong data, as something that's specific, like, hey, Caroline, how does Wednesday at 10 or Thursday at 2 work? The reason that that, that does not work as well on a cold email is because I'm being assumptive. I'm assuming Caroline wants to talk. All my, my only question is when. And that's, ta- that's trying to take the power out of her hands. And I don't know about you, but if someone is uh, almost forcing me to do something, it makes me want to avoid it. And I put up a wall and I, I don't want to engage in that. And so that's how your prospects might be feeling if that's how you uh, are sending cold emails. So I keep it short, five sentences or less. T- try to take out the eyes and me's, throw some videos in there um, and try to mix it up. So that's, uh, that's like my general framework for writing a cold email. I think that that's awesome. And, you know, we saw something in the chat and I I think both of you can probably speak to this. You know, people have tried mixing up, uh, you know, long emails and short emails. I I think it depends. I don't think there's a magic like silver bullet here. But Ashley, what do you think about that? Do Do you tend to write shorter initial cold emails or do you feel like it's good to have a lot of information? What do you think? Oh, I definitely go shorter, especially in the beginning. Uh, Later, as we've started like having conversations, yeah, write more be more in depth, but in the beginning, um, definitely try to keep it short because to Tom's point, we're just trying to gauge if they're even interested, if there's even a shot. And I don't know about you, but I don't have time to sit and write really long emails. And I I get it. You could create a cadence and you have a long email and uh, as one of the steps or whatever, but, um, I am trying to optimize for, you know, efficiency and getting the most out of every action that I take. So, um, just trying to gauge if there's interest, see if we can have a conversation. I would much rather get on the phone or like on a Zoom with somebody also rather than have exchanges back and forth over email. Um, so I, yeah, short answer is short emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Tom, I want to highlight something you said too. Like, I don't like the assumptive, hey, does Wednesday at 9 a.m. work? Like, that may work for some people, but for me, whenever I get something like that, I'm like, no. And you're also asking me to like, go check my calendar and find out if it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I think the key here is to make your prospect do the least amount of work as possible. Include your calendar link, ask for theirs, ask if you can work around their schedule, be a little more assumptive and less presumptive, I think is kind of the key here. Um, So I'd love to wrap up this discussion with cold calling, and then we'll get to some people's questions. Um, So let's chat a little bit about cold call openers. Ashley, what do you think about cold call openers? Do you feel like the hype is real around some of them that are like terrible and good? Like, what what do you think? Oh, gosh, this is so tricky because literally every human is so different. And like, I don't answer my phone ever. Yeah. So like, if you're trying to cold call me, my bad. Like, I don't know. It's just not going to work. But for people who do pick up the phone, like, I'm not going to say that like, hey, can I get 27 seconds of your time to tell you I'm calling? It's going to work better than, hey, it's Ashley from Apollo. Like, do you mind if we have a quick chat? Or, you know, like everyone's so different. I tend to, like, if I'm calling you, I I just want to be human. Like, this is any touches, LinkedIn, email, whatever. I'm just trying to be a human talking to another human. Mm-hmm. They pick up the phone. I'm stoked. First of all, that was something I learned. Kevin Dorth told me this very early on. He was like, you better assume they're going to pick up the phone. Yeah. Eight out of 10 times they're not going to, but you better <laughs> assume because if you're assuming they're not going to pick up the phone, then you're caught being like, oh, um, hey, Tom. Yeah. Hey, um, you know, <laughs> and you're stumbling. So be ready and and just talk to them like a human being. Yeah. Hey, Tom, it's Ashley from Apollo. I know I called you out of the blue. You got a, you got a few seconds. Or if you don't want to get, you know, you don't want to ask the question to get be told no. Just hey, how's it going? Like, I know most like some people have really mixed feelings about asking like, hey, how are you? Um, but I think it's also okay because they're human being, and maybe they're gonna come back and be like, who are you? Why are you calling? Guess what? Now you get to tell them who you are and what you're calling. Yeah. And it's so different. Like I see some stuff in the chat about like, well, you don't pitch on LinkedIn, but you do cold calling. They're so different. I mean, like connecting Very. And on LinkedIn is so different than getting someone on the phone. When you get someone on the phone, you're able to have a meaningful conversation. You're able to build that relationship a little bit quicker um, unless you get hung up on, which I'm sure SDRs in the room can kind of attest happens quite frequently. Um, But very, very different things just to kind of keep that in mind. But thank you, Ashley. Uh, Tom, what do you think about cold call openers? Yeah, I think um, just like with anything else, there's there's not a silver bullet. There's permission-based. There's not permission-based. 
I think the most important thing on a cold call is the confidence and the tone and the pace that you bring to that call. Mm -hmm. Because I can instantly tell, I get cold called now that I have like a founder title, I get cold called and cold emailed all the time. And I can tell in the first minute, does this person know what they're talking about? Are they confident in what they're doing and what they're selling? Or are they rushing and talking really quick and, and not giving a pause and not asking me a question and talking with a little bit of a higher pitch? It's like, or are they more relaxed? They're calling with a purpose. They're mm -hmm. here to have a conversation. And to me, that's more important. So whichever, whatever you're going to say in the first 10 seconds that makes you feel good and feel confident to kind of speak with your, with your gut a little bit, that I think is going to perform better than anything else. Um, and so I think the first you know, 10 seconds earns the next minute, that next minute mm -hmm. earns the next two minutes. And then all you're trying to do is earn a, a, you know, a discovery call from there, right? You're not trying to sell the solution. So um, I'd say, I'd say test around and see what, what you can be the most confident in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Let's wrap it up with some questions. We have a lot of questions in the chat. We won't yeah. be able to get to all of them, but Ashley, uh, someone asks, what are your thoughts on sending a quick video on Loom? Not necessarily in the first email, but maybe in a follow-up email. What are your thoughts on video messaging within emails? Love it. I think if you, if you can make a relevant, you know, personable email, uh, video, then yeah, give it a shot. I did it a lot at Chili Piper. Um, I would bring up like that person's website and kind of walk them through what it would look like if they had to, you know, and it, it yeah. was, it made a lot of sense. It got a lot of people's attention. So I think it's great. POV videos worked really well for me too. When I ran a team of SDRs at lead space, that's what we did uh, for one of our email campaigns and it worked really well. Um, Tom, let's hit another question here. Do you suggest being direct in the first cold email, like straight up mentioning what you're selling and solving, or do you kind of just try to pique their interest and leave them curious? Yes, I do. So the way that I would frame an email is I personalize the first sentence. I say a sentence about what the problem is that I, I believe they might have or that others like them have. Mm -hmm. I'll throw a sentence as to how I typically help. Um, I might not say my company name. I'm not going to give a bunch of details, um, but I might say like I'm helping sales teams to you know build more predictable pipeline, right? So I do want to say that, and then I'll throw my call to action. So a sentence, maybe two, but I don't get into like all the details and features and functions of what my product or service does. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. I think a good rule of thumb is to try to pique interest in the first, you know, couple touches and not inundate someone with information unless they're showing intent and unless they've, you know, reached out and are super interested. Um, Y'all, yeah. we only have a couple minutes left. This was so fun. <clears throat> a couple things uh, to wrap up here. There will be a recording of this sent out. Um, I wanted to say to Apollo, Ashley and I are representing Apollo. Uh, we have a sales community. We'd really love for everyone to join. I just dropped a link in the chat. If you want more discussions like this, daily discourse about sales topics, uh, please feel free to click that link, join our sales community. Uh, we'd be super excited. Ryan, it'll come right to your email. Uh, so it'll be emailed out to you after the show. And uh, you can always follow up with us after. Please connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, Tom, Ashley, anything you guys want to say? Any, any parting words? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I would just say thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Ashley, for uh, for the chat. I feel like we could have talked for three hours, right? I know. Yeah. Minutes, but, I know. Uh, and thanks for everyone for showing up. Hope, hope you got a nugget to take away. Um, best place to, to connect with me is uh, is LinkedIn. I'll throw my LinkedIn in the chat. And uh, I'm always down to, to talk shop. So let me know if I can help you with anything. Yeah, same. Big thanks to, to the team um, for being here. Thanks for everyone showing up. And... Yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn and always happy to chat about this stuff. As you can tell, Tom and I could talk for days. So, yeah. <laughs> Love it. All right, everyone. That's all for today. Thanks so much for a short and sweet show. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.